So now in this last section, we want to come up with some common problems that you're going to run into in farm ponds and some of the ways you can solve them. Of course, it's not going to be an exhaustive list, but it's a, at least a way to get you started. Um, now, I actually have some data on this. Dave Wiffles, for his uh, part of his thesis, did a survey of about 30 pond owners here in western Illinois. And most of the survey was a repeat of one that the DNR did back in 1963. So you're looking at a nice uh, nearly 40-year spread between when these surveys were given. And um, found some interesting results, I think. If you look at uh, the general class of problems here, the number one problem in both 1963 and 2004 was excessive vegetation. So, um, and if you look at the, the percentage of people who responded and said that this was a big problem, you see that, that this is still something, and it's even worse now, it's still a problem, and it's even worse now than it was 40 years ago. So that's why you know, we spent a whole lecture talking about aquatic vegetation, and we keep bringing up the different ways to control aquatic vegetation, because this is the big problem. Small fish were a much bigger problem back in the day than they are now. Over half the people surveyed in 63 were concerned with small fish and not so much these days. Um, sedimentation, I'm not sure if sedimentation was asked about in 63, but, but uh, you know, one in five pond owners thought that sedimentation was a problem. I would probably argue that this is an even greater problem. A lot of people are unaware of how much their pond is actually filled in. Fish kills are a much bigger deal now than they were in 63. Now, we can think of many different possible reasons why this is true. One possible reason is, is that people have their ponds maybe closer to their house now, or they spend more time, so they just notice fish kills. But this also could be a direct result of poorer water quality. And, and more fertilizer being used in the watershed. Turbid water, uh, although not being a huge problem, is definitely not nearly the problem that it once was back in the day. Uh, another, uh, one potential explanation is that people are not using these as much for watering livestock, and they're using them more exclusively for recreation. So you get the livestock out, the turbid water problem tends to go away. Undesirable fish species definitely dropped off. And if I look at all these numbers in, in general, I could make some arguments here. I could argue that it seems like the fish portion of fish management we're kind of figured out or we're, we're, we're doing very well at. You see that, that small fish are no longer a problem. That has to do with, uh, think of when ideas like the, the PSD and and that were developed in the 60s, 70s. So the the problem of small fish has has been diminished. Um, and desirable fish species, those problems have gone away because we are better at educating people. We know more about what species work, which ones don't work, what do people want to stock, what what can they stock. You know, there might be easier access to the more desirable species now. But I think we're losing the watershed battle portion of fish management in that the watersheds are becoming more, clearly the watersheds are becoming more agricultural and this is having an effect on the water quality. That's why you have even worse vegetation problems because there's more nutrients. That's why you have even more fish kills because there's more nutrients. And so that would be my argument is that... Um, we need to do a better job of educating people about the watershed and how the watershed changes are going to affect the pond. Okay, so if you've got problems, any of these problems or any other problems, the easiest solution is to just do nothing. Just leave it alone because it might not, you know, or, or, or convince yourself that it's, you know, this is how the pond is going to be and, and just learn to, le to live with it. That's not very satisfying. Um, for some people, that's the only way they solve problems. But, you know, if you're a fish manager, this is not a solution for you. We're in this business because we think that it's worth putting some effort in to try to make things better. 
the next easiest solution, the one that, that, that you reach for a lot, is just call a do-over. Just whack the pond. Either drain it, rote known it, drain it and rote known it. Um, just hit the reset button and realize that when you start a new pond, you'll have several good years of good fishing and clean water, and eventually, um, if you don't put any effort into it, it's all going to go to heck, and you may have to start this over again. You know, that's possible. That's expensive and kind of a pain. So we want to find solutions that are maybe in between these two extremes. So vegetation, as we said, is the biggest problem, and it's something that you're going to have to deal with a lot. There's still a lot of education that needs to be done here. In Dave's survey, most of the pond owners attack their vegetation problem with copper sulfate, even for macrophytes. Copper sulfate I don't think works very well with emergent vegetation and macrophytes. Copper sulfate is more of an algicide, and you need more traditional herbicides for the um, emergent vegetation. Uh, of course, the best way to solve a vegetation problem is to reduce the nutrients. And again, this goes back to educating people about the watershed and what they're putting on their watershed is making it into the pond. We've talked about the mechanical, biological, and chemical ways to treat vegetation. Again, there's lots of detailed information out there. Different people have had success with different things. In general, glyphosate, rodeo, works very well for macrophytes. You need to use um, the rodeo, not the Roundup. The, ro uh, the rodeo has been licensed for aquatic use and it contains, I think, a surfactant or it contains another molecule that helps the glyphosate get into the aquatic vegetation better. But it's effective. It's widely used. Um, it seems to break down. It seems to be relatively non-toxic. But again, anytime you're using chemical, you need to be careful with it, realizing that chemicals also just require, you know, they require energy to produce the chemicals. Uh, the glyphosate uses a lot of phosphorus, the phosphate mines. So, you know, somewhere in that uh, product stream that there is uh, an increased impact on the planet by using these chemicals. But um, having said that, you're using small amounts uh, that are targeted in very specific applications and relative to what's sprayed all over the country, which you're using in your pond, is going to be a very small amount. So you can decide whether or not you, you feel that that is um, something that needs to be avoided. For duckweed and water meal, uh, sonar is a, a much better choice. A duckweed and water meal are a big problem in a lot of ponds, and they can make it just completely undesirable to go, even go down to the pond. So this can be a big problem. The best thing to do for duckweed and water meal is have the wind blow, because it just blows it all up in the shoreline. But in ponds that are down in a valley that are surrounded by trees, this is where you tend to have problems with duckweed. Sonar is expensive but it does the job. Again, um, copper sulfate is very good for controlling algae. It seems to be relatively benign. It's used in drinking water. Uh, barley straw is also a, a biologic uh, molecule. You take a bale of barley straw and throw it in the pond, and as this breakdowns, it creates things like, like humic acids and um, some other molecules that tend to, um, actually I, I think of the humic acids and some of the other molecules tend to combine and produce like um, something similar to, to hydrogen peroxide. I um, can't remember exactly how the mechanism here, but suffice it to say that it actually does produce compounds that help to, re to reduce the algae in the pond. But the caveat is, is that you need some sort of circulation. Uh, just throwing the bale in one corner of the pond often is not going to do very good, do very well, because the the bale won't break down as quickly, and the the chemicals will not be spread throughout the lake. But if you've got, say, um, a flowing water into the lake, or if you can spread it around the lake, or if you can throw in an aerator to help stir the water, those are all going to help the barley straw be effective. Okay, siltation. 
course, dry dams and sediment traps to keep the silt from getting into your pond or your number one line of defense. One thing I would suggest if you're having someone or helping someone build a new pond, get the depth at some georeference points right after its construction. Go out in your boat with your GPS, get some depth so that you know exactly how deep the water was at certain spots so that you can always go back and measure the loss in volume. Uh, repeat this often. Don't rely upon the owner to tell you how deep the pond is. I realize I'm sometimes hard on the owners, like they're completely unreliable. Um, and that's just through experience. It's not that people are liars. It's just that, that, that people are often mistaken. They, they often make assumptions. And often when you ask somebody how deep their pond is, they tell you how deep their pond was when they dug it. But they don't go out and measure it directly, and they're often surprised at how silted in the pond can be. Uh, of course, controlling the erosion along the banks and in the watershed is the best bet for stopping siltation. Uh, high inorganic turbidity is often a problem in farm ponds. Brown water, right? So, a lot of places, a lot of sources of this. Um, sometimes the substrate is of a particular composition that it tends to get stirred up easily. Often this is due to carp or bullheads that got in the pond and that are stirring it up or cattle that are getting in the pond and stirring it up. So get rid of those is going to help a lot. But once that stuff is in suspension, you need to get it to settle out. There are different ways that you can do this. The cheapest and, and easiest and often the most effective way is to add some sort of positively charged molecule. Usually this turbidity is a small negatively charged clay molecule and it's so small that gravity's effect is less than the magnetic repulsion amongst the negative charges. And so the particles can't settle out because gravity is barely pulling on them, but then they get near another negatively charged molecule which actually pushes them away. And this is called Brownian movement. This is sort of the random movement of very small particles. And so you need to do something to help these things settle out, and that something often is adding um, a cation with a positive charge that will bind to those negative charges. Now you've got a big, heavy, neutral molecule that can sink. Limestone, calcium carbonate, is probably the best way to go. It's cheap. You can get it easily. It dissolves easily. You can add all you want. All you're going to do is improve the buffering. And in my experience, it works great. I use this in my parents' pond and did a fantastic job. Gypsum also will work. Cal calcium sulfate. I had a, a landlord who was in construction and he had this problem and uh, he used a bunch of old drywall that he pulled out of a house he was demolishing. The drywall was gypsum and it worked. Um, some people recommend throwing in a regular hay bale, not barley straw, but a regular hay bale. The idea being that as it breaks down, it gives off hydrogen ions and other positively charged organic molecules. Um, never really heard of this working very well. And you're also adding nutrients. So not sure if it's, I, I don't think it would be, be as effective and as easy as spreading limestone. Okay. Low productivity or a pond that just does not have a lot of organic matter into it is rarely a problem here in western Illinois. Agriculture tends to put a lot of nutrients into the water. But if you feel like you need to fertilize your pond, make sure you're watching the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. If you put in too little nitrogen relative to the phosphorus, then nitrogen can become limiting and therefore organisms that can get nitrogen from the atmosphere get an advantage. Those organisms are cyanobacteria. We don't want cyanobacteria. They short circuit the food web. You know, they, they're, they're very few organisms will eat them. So the energy fixed by the, the blue-green algae will, become, will be unavailable to the rest of the trophic web. They produce toxins that can be mildly irritating to humans and have been known to kill like dogs and small organisms. So we don't want them. So you're looking at a minimum 20 to 1 nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, maybe even higher. you got to be careful with the application. Uh, you can go overboard, of course, and you get too much productivity 
and then you're going to get lots of decomposition, you're going to get anoxia, uh, you get lots of respiration at night, and so you could cause a fish kill that way. Be very careful with the timing. You don't want to do this in the middle of summer. That's when you're most likely to have your lowest oxygen levels and you're most likely to have problems with these. So you want to do this early in the spring, maybe in the fall. Now high productivity is going to be much more likely problem in farm ponds. And just as we said with vegetation, reducing the nutrients somehow. Buffer strips, don't fertilize, get rid of livestock, divert sewage. I've seen ponds where they had um, uh, septic tanks overflowed into the pond. That's no good. So you need to reduce that source of runoff um, to get the to reduce the nutrient influx. Uh, something that I suggest and I'd, I'd like to see more people try is to plant, plant these macrophytes. As I said, a lot of these aquatic macrophytes are beautiful and they can really make a pond look nice. And if you plant the right ones that aren't aggressive and they don't grow too tall, you can still fish around them. You can still get nice fish cover. Lily pads. I like water willow. Again, grass pickerel. And then they're going to suck up the nutrients um, before the algae can get them and maybe even shade the water some. Aeration uh, can be very good. Uh, it helps to counteract the, the loss of oxygen due to decomposition and respiration. Also, as you aerate the lake, if you can mix the bottom layers and you can mix oxygen from the surface down to the bottom, of course, keeping that uh, oxidized zone near the sediments will keep the phosphorus locked up in the sediments. Uh, note that there's a difference between um, aeration in a fountain. Aeration tends to be when you put a heavy-duty bubbler at the bottom of the lake and so you're pushing that water as the, the bubbles come up it pushes that water up and helps to stir the lake and that's designed to de-stratify the lake. That's the best if you're trying to reduce productivity and increase the potential habitat for fish. A fountain tends to take water from the surface and shoot it way high up in the air. Those are mostly for decorative reasons, okay? Certainly they're going to aerate as that water gets sprayed around, but they're only mixing at the very surface. They're not getting that huge volume of water down at the bottom. Um, and, and if all you're trying to do is mix, you're wasting a lot of energy by shooting that water much higher than it needs to go. Aquashade uh, is becoming much, much more common. It's very affordable and it really seems to do a good job. You know. When this first came out, it seemed like uh, people were adding too much and it looked like a toilet bowl and it didn't look weird, but now there are different companies and different mixes and different colors that look more natural, but they're still sucking up those photosynthetically active wavelengths of light. And um, we, we've been using this in my dad's pond and it seems to do a really good job. Um, now again, I'm not sure, you know, certainly these help to shade out the macrophytes from growing too thick. How much do they help with the uh, phytoplankton? I don't know, but it can't hurt. Uh, one of the new things I've been seeing are these bacterial solutions which enhance decomposition. The idea being that if you have more of these heterotrophic bacteria and certain heterotrophic bacteria, they'll speed up decomposition. And so then these, uh, instead of this continuous slow release of nutrients, the nutrients get broken down, but it only works if you've got a high flush rate. And so you've got these big organic molecules that tend to settle. If these bacteria break them down into their basic nitrogen and phosphorus that gets into the water, and then the water, and then get flushed out, that's going to be helpful. A lot of ponds don't have that good of a flush through rate though. And so all you're doing is going to, it's going to be counter, what you're doing would be counterproductive. What you'd be doing is enhancing decomposition, getting those nutrients into the water column, and actually stimulating a bloom. So I think that you need to be a little bit more careful with these. I haven't used them very much, I don't know that much, but it seems to me that without that flush through, you're going to have problems. Another thing we talked about that I don't have on this slide is this phoslock, which seems new, which is a kind of a clay that locks up the phosphorus and is supposed to kind of make a little cap on the bottom to help keep that phosphorus in the sediments. Be interesting to see how well these things work. Okay. Another potential problem that we might have is spillway mortality. 
A lot of fish like that running water, and when the water starts going over the spillway, out they go. And so, as we mentioned before, having a screen on your spillway is always advantageous. Either design it with a bow in it, which makes it less likely to, to clog up, or just make sure that you're checking it because you don't want that thing to get clogged up and your water then to rise and to top the dam. Um, maybe you can have a, a secondary emergency spillway in case that happens, but the easiest thing is to make sure it doesn't get blocked off. Now, if you don't have a lot of trees around the pond, there's not going to be a lot of debris coming through that can block that off. Um, you also always want to think downstream. So, again, when I talked about stocking hybrids or stocking um, species of fish that you're getting from a different watershed, you know, from a hatchery that gets their brood stock from a different watershed, don't forget that if those fish get out and can make it downstream, you want to make sure that they're not going to have a negative influence on the fish in the receiving waters. Again, with a lot of farm ponds, it's not really a problem because they're not near any natural streams. Okay. Feeding fish is a great um, way to interact the fish with the fish. It's um, something that's a lot of fun and can really enhance the fishing experience. This is one of the ways that I can think of, at least it's probably about the only way I can think of, to where you can get a pond where you've got big bluegill, big catfish, big bass. It seems like you need to have small bluegill so you can get big bass, or you need to stunt the bass out so they eat most of the bluegill so the bluegill get big or what have you. But if you're adding feed, now everybody can get big and fat. Of course, you have the same caveats as with fertilizer. You know, you're adding nutrients to the water, so if you feed too heavily, you can't have water quality problems. You can feed the fish by hand. Um, automatic feeders are affordable. Um, but on-demand feeders are something that I don't think a lot of people use that I think are very nice for farm ponds. And I, I've been trying to, to make some of these on my own. I think you can rig this up on your own or you can buy one pretty cheap. Basically, it's just a bucket with a funnel at the bottom. Fill it with feed. It's got a rod that extends out. And as you jiggle that rod, a little feed gets released into the water. And you can kind of train the fish, or eventually the fish learn that if they bump that rod, that they get feed. And once they do that, they're, it's awesome. And, and it's been shown to do a really great job in aquaculture, because you're not feeding the fish on your schedule, you're feeding the fish on their schedule. So they eat when they're hungry, and if they're not hungry, you're not wasting feed. And of course, there are very few moving parts, and, and if you're not down at the pond all the time, it's a way to feed the fish without a whole lot of maintenance. Hand feeding is an awful lot of fun, though. It's a great way. Um, kids love it. It's a great way to see what you've got. If you use floating food, you can kind of see the fish. You can see how well they're doing. You can see how much they're eating. If they're not eating very much, if there's a lot of floating feed left over, that might tell you that there's a water quality problem. But it's just so much fun. Um, I had a buddy who had... Uh, living on a small lake and, and they would feed the fish and they would go out on the dock and stomp on the dock to before they fed and pretty soon the fish learned that and so you would go stomp on that dock and you would just see ripples. You, the fish would just from all over the pond, man they would rush in, it was so cool. My parents when they used to feed their pond fish they'd come down and throw the feed in the water and they had two metal coffee cans, they'd bang them together. Man the fish would come and just boil and water so it's it's really a hoot okay another common problem that is becoming more common river otters um, they can wipe out a pond in a matter of days that's not an exaggeration and they will kill fish just for sport just for practice okay they will take fish and throw them up on the bank and just line the pond with dead fish and they're very good at it and since they're Numbers are coming back. We're going to start seeing more and more problems with these. They have been delisted. I'm pretty sure that they've opened up an otter trapping season here in Illinois. So that's pretty much your best bet is to uh, get a license and trap them or hire someone to trap them. Of course, you always want to double check on that because there may be seasons or uh, uh, sometimes they there are extra steps you need to do. But it's something that you have to keep an eye out for. 
Muskrats, also a common mammal problem in these farm ponds. What they like to do is uh, dig and tunnel, tunnel through the dam, just like we talked about before, creating those weak spots that water can flow through. Uh, of course, you can trap them. The best thing is to remove their feed, and they like cattails. So if you've got a lot of cattails, first off, you've got a problem, because cattails are a pain when it comes to a farm pond, because they can take over, they're very aggressive, they get so tall, they're difficult to fish around. Now, if you can keep cattails sort of up in the shallow end, or outside the pond, but where the, you know, prior to where the water runs in, they're fantastic at sucking up nutrients and sucking up, you know, stopping sediment, but they're just so aggressive. And if you can stay on top of them, you're, you're fine, but they're a favored food of the muskrat, and so if you have a lot of cattails, you might be getting muskrats, and so you might have to, to get rid of those cattails. Now, there are a lot of diseases in fish. They tend to be a much bigger deal in aquaculture, where you've got the fish in high density in a small area. You're going to get fish kills. Most of the time, the fish kills in a pond are due to oxygen. You don't see a whole lot of um, disease outbreaks in ponds. One parasite that you see a lot are uh, fish grubs, white grub and black grub. And when you see these is when people are cleaning fish and they're in the flesh and it startles people and it's not appetizing to see these little wormy like things in this fish fillet that you want to eat. They are not harmful to humans. As far as I know, I can't think of any fish disease that transfers to humans. Now there are bacteria that are in the water that are on fish that if you've got a cut, you know, that you can get, but there's bacteria everywhere. But things like this white grub, this black grub, you won't get it if you eat the fish. And so you can fry the fish and the grubs will just disappear. They, they're not harmful to you, but you know, they're kind of disturbing to people if they want to eat their fish. Now they're, they're pretty common. You see adult fish carry them all the time. If you have young fish, the young fish are in high density or the grubs are in high densities, like in aquaculture, then these things can be a problem and can start to cause mortality. But you know, fish carry a lot of parasites if you know what you're looking for. The life cycle includes a bird and a snail. Um, so the fish gets eaten by the bird, then the, the grub gets transferred back to the water where it infects a snail, and then it leaves the snail and goes into a fish. Um, so getting rid of the birds is one way to break that cycle, usually blue herons, but you've got to be careful because a lot of these birds are federally protected, and there's a, a law against harassing waterfowl. Um, kind of a gray area, but you need to be aware of that, that certain birds you can't just, you certainly can't kill them. And if you go out and you're chasing them or you train your dogs to go chase them, that might be illegal. And I doubt that anybody's going to gonna pitch a fit, you know, if you're chasing herons off your pond. But um, if you happen to get other rare water bird species, you need to maybe be a little careful here. Getting rid of the snails is another way to break the cycle. And stocking red ears is a great way of doing this. They do a fantastic job of, of cleaning out the snails. Um, or, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, about two and a half parts per thousand of salt will kill the snails. And the way people do that is to take a salt lick and just chuck it in the pond. Okay, fish kills. Real common. Um, so common sometimes that you just tell people that you know, unless they can get rid of the nutrients, they're going to have a fish kill every five or ten years. You get uh, um, different kinds of kills in the winter or summer. They're almost always due to lack of oxygen. Winter could be if you get uh, ice with heavy snow, so no light penetrates. That's a pretty common way to get a winter fish kill. Summer is probably much more common, and it's right about this time of the year. This is in mid-August. Water levels get low. Water gets hot. Can't hold oxygen. Metabolism gets really high, um, respiration and bacterial decomposition gets really high, and you can go anoxic. Every once in a while, you can get fall turnover um, that might might get a, you know mix a lot of anoxic water throughout the water column, or you might get a big serious algae bloom. Um, you might get a fish kill then too, but in summer fish kills, it's rarely due to turnover. It's mostly due to anoxia. 
course, this is going to um, be a problem. Ponds that are out of balance, meaning that you get poor fishing, they're often caused by a fish kill. This is an example. I think my dad's pond right now is going through this. We seem to have uh, an abundance of stunted bluegill, and he had a couple fish kills last year, year before. So, just um, the the lack of balance can be caused by a fish kill. Also, lack of balance just is a problem in and of itself. And that's something that needs to be addressed. Let's look at some data on changes in ponds as they age. I think I believe I sent you a handout with all these graphs on, so you can look at them in larger detail. This is from Dave Whipple's thesis, and he went out and, and I said he looked at several different ponds. They he put them in groups of 10-year-old, 20-year-old, and 30-year-old. And he looked at the changes as these ponds get older. And you see a few small trends here. For example, this is a, a length frequency histogram of largemouth bass versus pond age. And it's a little busy, but if you look at the, the black bars, that's your 10-year-old pond, your younger pond. And you see that the, the modal group is up here around 13 inches. Um, so you see the distribution tends to be skewed left. So you have a lot of fish, a lot of larger bass. If you look at the 20 year old mode, you see it's weird. You've got, uh, this could be a tiny thing, but you've got their mode is at these very small fish, but you see you, you still have these fish up here in the 13 to 14 inch range, but you also have a couple modes. You've got like a a clear group here. Now this is several ponds, so if this was one pond I'd say, oh well you've got a couple different age classes here, you know, 0, 1, and 2. But this is several different ponds, so that's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Now if you look at the 30 year old, you see the mode shifts and you've got smaller bass. Now of course the 30 year old and 20 year old ponds are the only ones where you get a handful of really large bass, but in general you see kind of a shift as ponds get older, the bass get smaller and smaller. And you can relate that to this graph, which is the same graph only for bluegill. Now if you look at bluegill, what do we have? The 10-year-old ponds tend to have smaller bluegill. 20-year-old ponds, the mode is a little larger, and 30-year-old pond, the mode is even larger. So there's no clear crystal clear trends, but this is fish ecology. There are no crystal clear trends. But it seems like as ponds age, you tend to get a shift towards smaller bass and bigger bluegill. Interesting. Now, this is interesting. This is the relative weight of largemouth bass versus the length. And again, split into our 10, 20, and 30 year old ponds. And very clear pattern here that the smaller, younger fish seem to have plenty of food. Then the fish sort of in the middle seem to be in the worst condition, probably have the least amount of food, and then your larger fish tend to also to be in better condition again. Um, it's interesting that this pattern is repeated across all the different pond ages. You see in the 30-year-old pond, it seems to be more moderate. Um, I do see like you've got kind of a wider swing. If you look at the 10-year-old ponds, there seems to be a very wide swing. Of course, you don't have any larger fish, these extremely large bass in these 10-year-old ponds. So it seems like it takes 10 years to, to get a bass, you know, 20 inches, <coughs> which is not surprising here at Western Illinois. So 20-year-old uh, the swing is still quite a bit, but that 30-year-old pond is more moderate, but still you have this very clear dip. It's interesting to me is this dip occurs right in that 12 to 15 inch slot range. Um, and so that could be that people are leaving those 12 to 15 inch fish and uh, you know that the people are managing their ponds in this way. So you have a high density of those fish. Um, but I don't know that a whole lot of people, I can't imagine that that people across all these different ponds are all managing their pond the same way. I just don't think there's that much management going on. I think that means that probably this is a size group that, that 
largemouth tend to hang up at here in western Illinois, and they seem to be very dense. You know, these are the eaters and the ones that are going to eat a lot, but they might be uh, running out of food. So it's something to think about, at least here in western Illinois. Now, if you same graph with the bluegill, you see a very, very even spread. Um, you see the 30-year-old ponds, they tend to dip a little bit, but, you know, um, you've got pretty good condition kind of across the board, or average anyway, for all the different age groups and size groups of the bluegill. It's interesting that in your young ponds is where you had your um, largest bluegill, but they're in poor condition. Those have to be probably, I would bet those are 10-year-old bluegill. Some of the originally stocked fish that just grew and grew and grew, but now they're starting to senesce and, and die and they're not just, you know, not healthy. Just a guess. Just don't know. Okay, now let's look at our tic-tac-toe graph from these pond data. And so we've got the prey, which is bluegill here on the y-axis, the predator on the x-axis. I've marked off sort of the, the general range that we shoot for these. And what kind of a pattern do you see here? It's the same kind of pattern you get if you shoot a shotgun at something, which is all over the place, okay? So if you think that being inside this central box is where you want to be to have balance, you see that this confirms what I said early on and what Swingle found, that most ponds are not in balance, right? We've got maybe three ponds that are in this range that will give us the best chance at balance. Um, and they're just, you know, clearly all over the place. So we can't see any kind of a trend as, uh, well, maybe, maybe we can see a trend as the ponds get older. Let's look here. Um, if we look at the older ponds, we see a bunch of the older ponds are over here in this quadrant. That would sort of match with what we saw earlier, that the older ponds tend to have smaller bass, larger bluegill, which is what we're seeing in this quadrant over here. Um, Younger ponds, uh, we, we don't have many, I think, hmm, I don't know why we only have a few 20-year-old ponds. I think maybe a lot of them are stacking up here at zero, zero. There are several ponds that, that uh, oh, you know what, some of those 20-year-old ponds may have also only had, um, like, catfish only or something in them. But you see no pattern in the 20-year-old ponds. The young ponds... Tend to, it tends to match what we saw earlier, that they kind of have larger bass and smaller bluegill. But again, very few of them are falling in that butter zone. Um, I think the last thing I want to look at here, one of the last things I want to look at, is the CPUEs in um, fish per hour of electrofishing that he caught. I'm, I'm not sure this is fish per hour. Um, these numbers are, are, can be really, look, look really high if they're fish per hour, but it doesn't matter. What we want to look at is the relative changes here as the ponds age. And you see that, uh, you know, bluegill density seems remarkably constant across pond ages. So um, the, pond, the, the bluegill tend to be get lar look like they're getting larger, but um, they're not getting any more numerous. Uh, the bass got kind of a weird pattern. They definitely drop off as the pond gets older. And so you're getting fewer bass. You see a big drop off from 10 to 20, and then it's sort of a, you know, almost a 50% drop off in catch per unit of effort. So that's interesting that in general the catch rate goes down, and then in the older ones it, it tends to pop back up. But remember, in those older ponds the bass are getting smaller. So you have fewer fish and they're getting smaller, which seems weird. You know, I would expect that they were smaller because there were more bass and that's and that they're cropping off these bluegill, but these numbers don't hold that up. Now if you look at all fish, and one of the explanations for why the, the patterns don't necessarily make sense is if you look at all fish, you see these extremely high values. So if you're looking here, you're seeing a, a um, you know, if you add these numbers together, uh, you're looking at 200, 300, you know, you're getting, add these numbers together, you get, you get close to this number. So mostly bass and bluegill here. But here, you've got a huge jump in the number, and it's not bass and bluegill. And so I'm thinking these probably are a lot of catfish-only ponds that were in there, or something that a catfish are driving this number. Um, 
and so here you've got uh, 287. So here you've got probably a lot of catfish that are in this total fish. And so that's also going to, to have an effect on the interactions between these fish. So at any rate, what you see here is some interesting trends um, across a, a large number of ponds and, and as the ponds get older, how they tend to change. And um, okay, that's, um, that's all I have for this recording. Now, um, I will say that uh, um, I gave you a lot of handouts. There's a lot of information out there. Um, some of those handouts are probably going to contradict each other, but there's lots of good information. The best thing is to look at information that's, that's derived for your specific area, and that's going you know, to that, rely upon the experience of people in your area, and you, you know, trust that compared to uh, information you get from other parts of the country. But, again, you're going to have some different ranges of suggested stocking rates or suggested fertility rates, or, and, and there's going to be uh, some contradictory information. That's why you need to get experience, and, and you need to use your experience as a professional fish biologist to make the best call when you're trying to give people um, advice for managing their ponds. Um, so that would be all the information I have on pond management strategies. Um, so thanks a lot, and I'll talk to you again a little bit later about reservoir management strategies. See ya.